Continuing tonight on the Ministry of Christ Miracles. <clears throat> Trying to cover them in a sort of a sequence. These, this is a different, these are different kinds of messages, as you probably have detected. But it's important uh, to me that uh, young and old are acquainted with Christ and what he did and why he did it. Because when he was in the in the earth, when he came to the earth, we beheld his glory. See? There was something about Jesus that opened up aspects of God people had never seen before. Right. And he lived it out before, before people. <clears throat> Speaking of this, right after the very first miracle Jesus performed, <coughs> when he was turning water into wine, it says in John 2.11, this beginning of miracles mm -hmm. did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. And so that sort of sets a tone for what these miracles are really all about. Jesus did have compassion on the multitudes. Make no mistake about this. He was, our Lord is tender and compassionate. He really was. But over and above that, there was something that overshadowed that whole thing, is that people were learning something about God in Christ. He was manifesting forth what deity was like. Yes. Because the world had grow, had developed distorted views of God. Mm -hmm. Even Israel had distorted views of God. Even though God had revealed himself to them, they were kind of led astray and got to thinking the wrong way about God. Mm -hmm. And some thought he was just austere and was looking for a reason to hurt people and this sort of thing. But this Jesus manifested forth his glory. God, God has appointed a day when he's going to come against all the unrighteous. Yes, right. Make no mistake about this. But this is not what he's doing now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes. It's not what he's doing now. What he's doing now is he's opening the door of salvation to people so that his grace can be poured out upon them. Now tonight we're going to consider the occasion when Christ paid some uh, temple tax with a coin from a fish's mouth. This is a kind of an unusual account. Matthew is the only one that records this. And it's, uh, it gives a little index into Christ. This is found in Matthew 17, verse 24 to 27. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented or came to him first, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. <coughs> Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Mm -hmm. Notice how this Jesus is sort of matter of fact with Jesus. No big, no big affair. This is remarkable. This, is a, this is a, kind of tells, exposes Jesus to you that, you that circumstances may shake you and the questions of people may kind of rattle you, but this... This doesn't occur to Jesus. Even yeah. when he was in the earth, he just was in charge of the situation at all, at all times. Now let's look at the uh, at the background of this text. What had happened? Because uh, in, when you, I show you these backgrounds to show you how Jesus could quickly adapt to any circumstance. This is the divine life. When the life of God gets into a person, and Jesus is the ultimate person. Uh huh. You can handle situations without being rattled. Now, it's to the, I understand it's to the degree that Christ is in you. I, I understand it. But this is the whole point. That uh, people, whether it's you or anyone else, that gets rattled when something happens, see? This is a fundamental deficiency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're not here to criticize each other of this because we've all got areas where this happens. But what we're here to say is that God in a person <coughs> alters how they react. To troubling, in this case, a, a kind of a question that could have been taken like, well, they're just trying to find fault. You know, it could have been a random question. 
And Jesus, he could he could be on a mountain peak and then he could descend into this arena of, of interrogation and he could make the transition without it rattling him. Mm -hmm. I, I know from personal experience about <coughs> about being on a mountaintop like on the Lord's Day and descending into the work arena on Monday and it's like I have a rough landing, but see Jesus never had a rough landing. I must admit that I do. <laughs> Jesus didn't, and that's what we want to see here. So this is right after the Mount of Transfiguration when they came down, and that man with the possessed child threw the child of fire and water. He healed him after that. And then Jesus had been uh, had started talking to his disciples, increasing how he talked, how much he talked about about his imminent death. He's about halfway through his ministry here, about a year and a half, and he starts talking. To, pointedly about his coming death, acquainting his disciples with it. And even after all this talking, it still caught him unaware mm -hmm. when it came. Now, Matthew 17, 22 and 23 reminds us of this. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And, and they were exceeding sorry. Well, it is much made of this in Scripture, how that Jesus started focusing on his death in his discussion with his disciples. Mm -hmm. This became, there came a point in his ministry when this became a dominant theme in his private discussions with his disciples. I want to mention some of these. Matthew 16, 21, this followed the good confession of Peter. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised again the third day. She began to open this up. And you've got to, you've got to realize that they thought, they were looking at Jesus as a, it's kind of a, come to offset the Roman Empire. We're going to, we're going to get things back in the glory days like yeah. it was back in David. And, and, and it looked like this is the kind of thing that's happening. He's, he's, he's not confounded by anything that comes his way. He's working these great signs and wonders. And all of a sudden he starts talking about how he's going to be killed and raised again the third day. This didn't mesh well in their minds at first. Mark 8, 31 says he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed after and after three days rise again. It's part of his teaching. Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. They shall kill him. After that he's killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you will be afraid to ask Jesus some things too if you're aware of his presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. Jesus spoke with such a note of finality. That you sensed this is no guesswork here. He, Jesus is telling us something here, but they they couldn't grasp it at first. Mark 10, just a little later, 33. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. That's a pretty strong talk, huh? Mm -hmm. But he's like burrowing in on this. He's like, Mark gives you three different occasions where he picked up this teaching. Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go out of Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. See? This was a pivotal point in God's dealing with men. Yes. Jesus is acquainting them with it. Now, it'll come home to them after mm -hmm. Pentecost. And it gelled, all this gelled in Peter's mind on the day of Pentecost. And he expounded why Jesus died and how it took place, and he was raised again from the dead. See, but at this time, they, was, they weren't very acquainted with it. 
In other words, Jesus, as he ministered, we went about among men ministering, he ministered with this cloud of his imminent death hanging over him. Uh -huh. He never put this from him. A man would want to put this off to the last minute. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Let's don't think about it until it really comes to pass. Mm -hmm. Not Jesus. Too much hinged on this. Mm -hmm. The salvation of the world hinged on this. It's very important that he carry it out. That he perform his ministry with this in mind, mm -hmm. and that his disciples become acquainted with this with this fact. I'm not here to stay. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying. You're not going to enjoy my presence like this all the time. Mm -hmm. There's going to come a different different administration when you're going to be living by faith, not by not by sight. So this is the greater reality. Christ's death and resurrection is the dominating factor. The dominating thing that drove Christ was not the condition of men. Mm -hmm. That is not the dominant consideration that drove him. It was what he was going to do in regard to sin. Yes. That was his dominant consideration. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the circumstances behind this miracle. They come down from the mountain, meet this father and son, Jesus teaches them about his imminent death. And as they come into Capernaum, someone corners Peter. He doesn't ask Jesus, he asks Peter. Doth your master pay tribute? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a loaded question, let me mm -hmm. tell you. <laughs> and Peter knew. Mm -hmm. He said, yes. How's that? See, you walk with Jesus, you need to be acquainted with what Jesus does. Someone, you, the next time you see someone with a brace that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? Say, hey, hey, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I, Peter did, he knew. He knew what Jesus would do. See, it was assumed that, it was assumed, the people asked, it was assumed that the Jesus' disciples knew about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You might be surprised how, how few people that were the name of Christian do, in fact, know about Jesus. If you ask questions about him, they... They don't have any idea. But see, this is not this is not the norm for the kingdom. Now this was not a, a political tax. This was not a tax like a USA federal income tax. That's not what he's talking about. He talked about that kind of money in Matthew 22, and in verse 17 through 20 through 22, where they asked him about where they should pay tribute to Caesar. That was another question. That's not the question being asked here. Mm -hmm. Tribute here does not mean political tax. This was the temple tax. And some of the versions do read that, the temple tax. <laughs> or the two drachma tax. There were two units of money that were assessed as a temple tax. It was levied on all Jews according to the law. While it started while they were in the wilderness, traveling through the tabernacle, tra traveling through the wilderness with the tabernacle, the Jews were told to annually pay a certain amount of tax for the upkeep of the tabernacle, later for the upkeep of the temple. Now here's how the law is talked about it, Exodus 30 verses 12 to 15. When I take it to some of the children of Israel, after the number, that we would say a census, when you take a census, then shall I give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When I number them, that there be no plague among them. Well, you want to see how this is remarkable, the way God is talking here. That there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give everyone that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, special money used for the sanctuary. And he adds a shekel is 20 giras. A half shekel shall be offered to the Lord. Everyone that passeth among them that is numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. The rich shall not give more. The poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give the offering to the Lord to make an atonement for your soul. That's how it all got started. Mm -hmm. And as time progressed, this was an annual event. Tally up how many people were there, 20 years old and upward, which were roughly numbered 602,000 when they were going through the wilderness. And then every person divvied up this offering with an upkeep for the upkeep of the tabernacle. 
Exodus 38, 26 speaks about it. A becca for every man that is half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. For everyone that went to be numbered from 20 years old and upward, 600,000 men and 3,550 men. So they, they gave this. Later, this kind of fell by the wayside for a while, and men renewed it. In 2 Chronicles 24, 6, the king called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Why hast thou not required the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection? And he's talking about the orders in Exodus 30. The collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of God, the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. Now some people don't even know God thinks like this. Mm -hmm. God thought about the upkeep of that tabernacle. I suppose God being God, he could have miraculously mm -hmm. caused there always to be enough flour to bake the cakes and always enough incense to burn and always enough oil to burn in the lamps. And... But instead, he, he levied a tax that was payable. Everybody could do it. The rich could pay it. The poor could pay it. Mm -hmm. And they paid it for the upkeep of the tabernacle. It was roughly equal, they tell us, to two days' wages. Two days wages out of the year. This is over and above the tithe. This was mm -hmm. this was over and above the tithe that they gave. And over and above the offerings that were over and above the tithe mm -hmm. they gave to the Lord for the upkeep of the tabernacle. Now Nehemiah <laughs> he also restored this, this practice. Nehemiah ten thirty two. Also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of the shekel for the service of the house of God. And after this it kind of diminished, it was a half before it started a, a third, and then we understand as time progressed, it picked up again to the half shekel, which were two mm -hmm. particular coins of the spe it was special money they used for the temple. Mm -hmm. It was a, after the shekel of the sanctuary. What the Bible calls it. Well, so this is the tax they're asking about. These are the, these are the we might call the church treasurers. Mm -hmm. And they say to Peter, you know, does your master uh, contribute to the collection? That's what it's up would say today. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, well, yes, as a matter of fact, he does. That's his, uh, that's his answer. Mm -hmm. Now this, so Jesus had been doing this. Mm -hmm. Which was another aspect of him humbling himself. Yes. Yes. He humbled himself to, mm -hmm. to pay the temple tax for the upkeep of the temple. He, mm -hmm. he humbled himself. Now this is over and above for the, the tithe for the priests. See, mm -hmm. the priests, their food, their, all this sort of thing. That came out of the tithes of the people. But this is over and above for the upkeep yes. of the tabernacle keep, and the temple. Keeping the oil there, keeping the incense there, mm -hmm. making sure the fire pans and all the utensils were were kept in good shape and it was all all part of it. The loaves of bread were always baked. Now after they, they then they went into the house and Jesus he he corners Peter and he delivers a rather challenging question to him. He says uh, when he came into the house he prevented him or came before him saying what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or strangers? What do you think? What do you th some people don't know that Jesus asked this. What do you what do you think? What do you think? You know, there's some places that this is never asked anybody. What do you think? What do you think about this? Let me show you how this is mentioned several times. Matthew 21, 28. What think ye? Mm -hmm. He gave a parable. A certain man had two sons. He came to the first said, Go work in the, today in my vineyard. And the son said, He wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. He came to another son said, Work in my vineyard. He said, Okay, I'll do it. And he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And he said, what, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? Another case in Matthew 22, 44. Jesus said, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? What do you think? In your heart. You had to be sensitive to him who's speaking from heaven to know this. Mm -hmm. But in your heart, Jesus does want to know what you're thinking. What do you think about this? Amen. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And okay, so this is good for us to interrogate each other. Say, what do you, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
going to draw out of the people. See, why is this? Because a man's the way a man thinks tells you what he is. Yes. Mm -hmm. How he thinks. Mm -hmm. If a person's thinking automatically plummets down to the earth, that's because he's earthly. Mm -hmm. If his thinking automatically goes down to carnal, that's because he is carnal. Mm -hmm. If a person's thinking automatically gravitates toward thinking about God and the Spirit, it's because he's spiritual. Mm -hmm. That's why. So what do you think? Not asking for, he didn't say, what, it's not like, hey, what's your opinion on this? It's, that's not exactly it. He's looking for the insight mm -hmm. that, a person, that a person has. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you think? How are you thinking? As soon as uh, something happens that's inconvenient or that it's... Uh, Hurtful? Do you automatically think the worst thing? Or what? How do you think? Mm -hmm. It's important to know. Mm -hmm. what? Well, he asked uh, Simon, what do, do the kings of the earth, do they tax their children or do they, they tax people outside their household? Which one? Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus uh, is speaking here of himself. Mm -hmm. He's going to tell you that he, he really humbled himself to pay this tax. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he owed this. Uh -huh. That's what he's going to show them. Mm -hmm. It isn't that you can cite in the law, because I made all things. Yes. <laughs> I'm my father's son, mm -hmm. and a temple's my father's house. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I owe this tax. Mm -hmm. I'm humbling myself. Mm -hmm. So there's not an undue cause of offense before God. Now, what does he mean when he says that, uh, about the children being free? Well, he means that they were not obligated to pay the tax. The children were not obligated to pay the tax. Now, an indication of this is found in 1 Samuel 17, 25. And uh, this is where David asked, what could be done for the man that confronts Goliath and take him down? Mm -hmm. What will be done? Here's what, what was... Saul said he'd exempt him from taxes. That was one yeah. of the things. Yeah. So here's what he said. 1 Samuel 17, 25. The men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that's coming up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king shall enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free mm -hmm. in Israel. So he'd be tax exempt. Mm -hmm. And his lineage, his old father's house, would be tax exempt. Mm -hmm. So that was a, Jesus was his father's son. He was tax exempt, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. But when Jesus, this was a technicality. But Jesus is teaching us something here. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things we do that are right that you don't have to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you don't do them because there's a, there's a law on you that you have to do it. Now, some people did have the law and that they had to do it. But, but Jesus, not, Jesus, he's setting an example here. Yeah. If you've got to have a thus saith the Lord for everything you do, this is not, not a good sign. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a good sign at all. Jesus forfeited his rights as a son of God. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this forfeiture would fully be made known in his death when all of his rights would be taken away in his death. Romans 8, uh, Acts 8.33 says this. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. In other words, all of his rights were taken away from him. But he, he came back from this. This wasn't his undoing. Mm -hmm. Understand. So when he says, then are the children free, he said, then the children are exempt. We do, we, we, this temple tax is there. It was levied on God's people, but this is my father's house, and you're my friends, and if we want to really be technical about it, we can say, we don't owe it. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's not Christ's manner to respond in that way. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, the temple said, this is my father's house. Yes. And he was an heir of the world. Yeah. If anybody should pay taxes, it should be to him, not him to them. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He, Romans 4, mm -hmm. uh, 13 tells us that, he, that the promises were to Abram and his seed that he would be heirs of the world. So Jesus technically was a receiver. 
the fact that he gave was a was an act of humiliation yeah. as well as an expression of his nature. Don't ever remember that, Peter. This is an aspect of Jesus dwelling among us. When Jesus dwelt among us, he like subdued his rights. Yes. He forfeited his rights. And he, what he did, he, he did things other people did, like he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He paid the temple tax when it was due. He honored the feast days when they came. He did all of this. But technically speaking, this was the Son of God. He was not under obligation to do that. He didn't come into the world to do that. He came into the world to give himself as sacrifice and a ransom for many. But he did it out of an act of humility. He, it was part of him being made, as Hebrews 2.17 says, like unto us. Involved in being a partaker of flesh and blood. Now on our part, <coughs> we should learn to, uh, to do this same thing. To forfeit some of our some of our rights. For instance, Romans 13, 7 and 8. In this particular text, he's talking about income tax. Mm -hmm. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute or tax, to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So, so humble yourself, God. If you're in a place where it's accustomed to bow before the dignitary, bow before him. <laughs> Do it. Pay your taxes. Don't try and say, oh, it's unfair. We don't, shouldn't have to pay. There are people say this. Well, it's unfair. We don't have to pay. But humble yourself, God. Remember the Son of God. Amen. You can tell, you could make a big case for I'm really not a citizen of the world. I really don't belong here, so why do I have to go by all these, obey all these laws and all these rules? Yeah. Humble down. Yeah. That's what Jesus did. He humbled down. Mm -hmm. He said, notwithstanding. See, it's true, Peter. On a technical point, if we were a lawyer, if we were a Pharisee, mm -hmm. if we were a scribe or a Sadducee, we'd back out of this and say, we don't have to pay this. Mm -hmm. But notwithstanding this circumstance. Mm -hmm. We don't live by a rigid set of rules. Mm -hmm. See, faith makes a person flexible. Not flexible as in compromise. Mm -hmm. Flexible so as not to offend. Yes, amen. There's a difference there. There's the matter, of, we understand, there's the matter of walking in wisdom toward them that are without. The scripture tells us do this. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And Jesus chose so to do this, so that he was not viewed as a mere reactionary. He wouldn't fall in line with the scribes and the Pharisees, but the multitudes of people did not see him as reacting against the, the uh, Thai Roman tyranny. He was, this wasn't how he was viewed at all. And so he says, to avoid offending them, to avoid offending them, let's, uh, we're, let, we're going to do something about this. Now here's what you do, Peter. I want you to go down to the sea, take a hook, throw it in, and the, the first fish, the size of the fish at this point isn't the point. First fish that comes up, open his mouth, there'll be a coin in there, take it out, and go pay the tax. Now here's an example of, a, of the person who, who did have, in fact, dominion. Mm -hmm. You know what the first thing mentioned when God said he made man to have dominion? You know what the first thing mentioned was? The fish of the sea. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing mentioned. Mm -hmm. The fish of the sea. Now Jesus really did have it. There are people yes. today who say, we've got the dominion, you know, but they're just hot air. They don't have the dominion. Yeah. They couldn't stop a flood. Mm -hmm. Flood came to New Orleans, it hit the churches too. Mm -hmm. They didn't have power over this, but he did. Mm -hmm. The fish were at his back. Yeah. Well, he only did this so far as we know one time. It wasn't every year they called up a fish. It wasn't like, it wasn't like that. Jesus is making a point here. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of power I have. Yeah. But I'm going to table uh -huh. this power. I'm not going to employ this power 
all the time just for convenience of the flesh. Yes. See, divine power, you've got to really see this, divine power is not intended to make it convenient for the flesh. Yes. There are some people that do. They teach that this is actually what it, actually the way God works, is to make it better, make a life better for you here. Things be better, guaranteed better for you here. But there's some things that just takes a miracle mm -hmm. to get things done, and, and it's just done one time. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all this was done. One, one time. For the most part, this power of Christ was greatly subdued. For instance, we read in Matthew 4, 2, that he was hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> man, a man has dominion over the whole earth. He would have no trouble getting a meal again. We know an angel fixed a meal for the line to the prophet, fixed a meal for him. What did he use? It was a miraculous meal. Mm -hmm. Jesus could have fixed a miraculous meal. He fed 5,000 men with five, uh, five loaves and two fishes, but he didn't feed himself that way, mm -hmm. nor did he make a practice of doing that every time anyone had, a, had difficulty. Divine power is not intended to meet your personal needs. Mm -hmm. It's true that God can do this. I understand that. But that's not the focus of divine power. It, the kingdom of God really does not revolve around us. Amen. It really doesn't. It revolves around Christ and the will of Almighty God. John 6, 4, John 4, 6 says that he was weary when he sat on the well. Mm -hmm. The Son of God? Weary? You do not think that he could he could give you supernatural strength. You do not think he could have given himself supernatural strength, but he humbled himself, see. Mm -hmm. Instead. In another place, Matthew 8 20 says he had no place to lay his head. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose technically he could have created a house and a place to place wherever he stayed. I suppose he could have done that, but he humbled himself. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he knew that in this world we're he's, he was a stranger. Mm -hmm. He was going to be here for a short time and go back. So he refused to settle in. Mm -hmm. Or what about those women? Luke 8, 3 says that ministered to him of their substance. You think he could have given them substance. Mm -hmm. But he humbled himself. I'm showing you something about Jesus here that you see in this text that Jesus really was not a citizen of this world, even though on the surface it looked like he was. Because he did all the things the other people did, but it wasn't because he had to. Mm -hmm. It was not out of that reason. And he said, when you take this fish up, you find a piece of money. See, in uh, other versions, the NIV says a four drachma coin. What a four drachma coin was, it was the exact amount mm -hmm. of the temple tax. It was the exact amount that was in the fish's mouth. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you pay that for me and you. He didn't say me and, and the twelve. Mm -hmm. You pay that for you, you and me. It'll, uh -huh. it'll cover, it'll cover uh -huh. ours. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> there, are, there are experiences that you have with the Lord Jesus in which you sense of me and me. You sense that the, I'll do this for you and, and for me and for you. Uh, I'll be blessed by it, you'll be blessed by it. Mm -hmm. Jesus operates like this. Now what a vivid picture of redemption this is. A payment for me uh -huh. and for you. Yeah. When Jesus died, he first offered himself yes. Amen. for me mm -hmm. to God. Then in his death, he offered himself for us, yeah. for thee. It's a very vivid picture of redemption. So Jesus, there was two prices to be paid. He had to pay one in order to be a suitable sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Then he had to pay the other for us. And it's pictured right here. Matthew 9, 7 says he first had, like the high priest of old, he first had to offer for himself, then for the sins of the people. Mm -hmm. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says Christ our Passover was offered yeah. for us. So he's ex the exact amount that God wanted. Amen. It wasn't... Uh, and this fish will bring up this coin, and it will be a hundred. It will be a hundred of these coins. Uh, and then you pay the temple tax and pocket the rest. Oh, uh -huh. It's just what you needed for that temple tax, that's, and that's all it was. Amen. Now, I will venture, uh, this I'm kind of on uh, dangerous territory here, but sometimes God will only give you just like what you need. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and he won't, you, he, you may think in terms of an account 
a comfortable account or a cushion or <laughs> you may think that way That's right. mm -hmm. and God can bless you with this I do understand but here this is an aspect of God you want to be acquainted with you be, need to be content with what you need Amen. give us this day our daily bread Amen. what we need that's what and then you'll find if you if God can trust you with more he'll give you more mm -hmm. uh, some people will give him more and he waste and they're not, they're not, they're not frugal with it. Now uh, here's some things to learn from this. Your rights do not always have to be honored. Mm -hmm. Now we live in a, we live in a society when it's my right, I got my rights. Well, uh -huh. sometimes you need to put them away. Mm -hmm. And say, I don't have my rights. Yeah. I'm going to forfeit my rights. Mm -hmm. I suppose Jesus had the right to just put a collar on the disciples and may, and just force them to do this and force them to do that and they couldn't do anything unless he told them to do it. Mm -hmm. Man, it's not, that's not the way Jesus was. Yeah. He didn't have a right technically. God has a right to tell you when to get up and when to get, go to bed and he has a right. If you want to get right down technical about it, he's got a right to do it. Yeah. But that, that's not how he operates. And this is not the suggestion that you can be loose in your living. Mm -hmm. It's suggesting that when you stay with Jesus, you really stay with Jesus, a lot of things are covered mm -hmm. that aren't covered under law. Amen. The fact that Peter was with Jesus mm -hmm. and didn't take off somewhere else if they come back and say, well, we've been about several days with Jesus. I'm going to go back and check on the, see how it's doing down at the fishing dock, see how things are going there. He stayed with Jesus and that's how, <laughs> this, that's how his need was met. Mm -hmm. So you're right not always have to be honored, and then when you are with Jesus, your needs are met. Mm -hmm. God is able to supply all your need, mm -hmm. not needs, need, singular. All your need, according to his riches in Christ Jesus, riches in glory. But here's the catch. You have to stay with him mm -hmm. to get them. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, our lives are to be conducted without offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus says, nevertheless, that we not offend them. We don't want to. We don't want to offend them. We don't want them to think that we are less honorable than the other people who <laughs> come to the temple. So we're going to. Uh, we're going to do this not to offend them. Philippians 1:10 says that uh, that we may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. Mm -hmm. Till the day of Christ. So if people can find fault with you and it's legitimate, don't complain because they found one of your weaknesses. Don't, don't be complaining about that. Or say, they're just picking on me. We all have our faults. Well, you shouldn't. I'm sorry. You, have, you don't have a right to have any faults. When I get down to rights, what's right and wrong? Faults are never right. So we don't boast that we have them. We say, well, God, even though I might be able to give a sound reason why I shouldn't do this or that, that the world suggests, even though my speed limit sign out here says 25 down here, I might say, I've calculated it out, and it's fully safe to go 30. See, you may be able to reason it all out. Say, I get better mileage that says 65. I get better mileage when I go 70. To, you may reason it all out, but after it all said and done, that they that we not offend them. Amen. Why? Because it's hard to do a work for God among a people that you're aggravating all the time. Uh -huh. That's why. That we not offend them. Well, Jesus confirmed who he was in this. I'm a, the son of the, the one who owns the house. <laughs> he confirmed who his disciples are. You're my children. Mm -hmm. See? And he confirmed what belonged to God. My father's house, we're free. He confirmed how God sees we're free. Mm -hmm. Which means this is like just a, a kind of an added benefit. When you do what you don't have to do, you get credit for going beyond. See, yes. going beyond. Now God gave this privilege to people under the law. He told them first what they had to do. Tithes. They had to be the first and the best off the top. Get to me. Then he said, offerings. Now, I see he didn't tell you how much. Mm -hmm. Daddy left up to you. But in the offering, that told who you really were. Mm -hmm. The tithe didn't tell who you were. The offering told who you were. This told who Jesus 
really was. Well, it's one of these intriguing incidents of Scripture. It shows when a person has real power over nature, it serves his purpose. Yes. Huh? And here, here was another one of those sea creatures that uh, served Christ's purpose and brought his tax money up. We do suggest you not try to duplicate this. I never have heard anyone, really, the, the miracle mongers, I really have never heard them trying to pay their taxes by this method. But if they had the power they say they have, why couldn't they? Why couldn't you say, well, I, I, I end up owing 2720 and cast in a fish, and there it is, comes up with a check for 2000 <laughs> Well, Jesus didn't do it all the time either.